G'day guys, welcome back to the Football Come Down for Round 9, a show where we unpack the weekend of action and uh, with the help of you guys as well, you guys put some comments about each game in the community tab on this YouTube channel. So we're going to discuss each of these games and give my general thoughts as well as reference your comments. So I thought this was a pretty good round. I feel like we had a few stinkers, no doubt, but there was probably like three Game of the Round contenders. I actually think maybe the best was saved for last between Adelaide and Brisbane, but the first couple of games to start the round were pretty outstanding as well. So let's start with Thursday night. Carlton took on Melbourne and ended up winning it by a singular point. They got 38 points in front, six goals straight to nothing. I think, uh, was it Petrarch that might have kicked the Demons' first goal? And, you know, a real... I say the Clash of the Titans, that used to be a phrase I used sarcastically on this channel, but it kind of was a really heavyweight battle in individual terms as well. You know, I thought Sam Walsh has had an outstanding return to football. Like, the things this guy does with no preseason for the second year in a row is outstanding. He had 34 touches, 11 tackles, five clearances, and a goal. He wasn't great by foot. I think he only used the ball at about 52% efficiency, but the other heavyweight in this uh, equation was Petrarca, who also went at about 57%, but 21 disposals, five goals, 10 score involvements, seven tackles as four, and four clearances. So it was a heavyweight battle in many respects. And, um, you know, it was an absolute cracking game. And it continues this kind of weird trend between Carlton and Melbourne. Six of the last eight clashes between these two sides, I believe, has been decided by five points or less. So if this, if this rivalry starts to trend into like finals and grand finals, you could be approaching the West Coast Sydney rivalry that was made famous Nearly 20 years ago, my God. Big win for Carlton. Big win. And, um, you know, big in the context of the season, getting one over the Ds, who just beat Geelong the week before. Uh, a really good effort. And, yes, I think Pommy in Oz, I watched his review of it. He summed it up best. It's like you can get frustrated that your team gave up a big lead early uh, and nearly lost the game, or you can just enjoy it. Similar to the second game I'm going to talk about in this game, like sometimes when you play good teams, you have to accept they're going to come back. We've got one comment here from Richo the Cat. And it's a big wall of text, so I'm going to summarize it, but put it up on the screen. Richard the Cat says, My takeaway is just because your team loses a close game doesn't mean they were robbed. There's many factors that go into every loss, many moments that decide a game. I say this because I've seen Melbourne supporters say they were robbed of the victory due to the camp dangerous tackle. I'd say the biggest factor as to why Melbourne lost was the fact that they didn't score one point until Carlton was six goals up. So, yeah, in summary, I, I do agree with that. There, that probably was a contentious free, uh, in my opinion. Like, it's tough in the heat of the moment. But I do agree generally, sometimes we hyper-focus on one thing that happened at the end of the game, and we tend to forget all the micro moments that may or may not have led to goals earlier in the game. Let's talk about another absolute rip-snorter between Geelong and Port Adelaide. And, um, you know, it's an interesting little trend here. Geelong, this is their third loss at GMHBA in 12 months, I reckon. Um, there was GWS, Fremantle, the Bulldogs, and Port Adelaide. Sorry, that's four now. And uh, does that mean anything? Probably not, because I know they had injuries last year. But this was one of the more surprising results of the weekend, if not the most, specifically because Port Adelaide got 49 points up in the second quarter. Like, I never thought I would see that. And I feel like, comparatively, I rate Port Adelaide quite highly. But it's just that Geelong have been generally quite infallible there. And, you know, Port Adelaide were missing Connor Rosey, got slapped by the Crows last week. Willie Riola kicked four goals in this game. Junior Rioli kicked four goals in this game. Jason Horn Francis, again, outstanding. I thought Ollie Wines was really good in the clinches too. Zach Butters. The Cats came hard like we knew they would. And, you know, similarly, I don't think Port Adelaide, and I'm not saying I've seen this from them, but I'm sure they wouldn't be thinking too much about the fact that they almost let slip a big lead. This is quality opposition. They will come back. And Port Adelaide really have, I don't want to say resurrected their season, but, you know, I think many people are quick to write off Port Adelaide, including their own fans. And they've really reasserted themselves back in this top team uh, conversation, despite losing to the Crows seven days previous. The Cats have now dropped two on the bounce. Um, you know, I think we'd be silly to, to really read too much into that. We'll see how they go, although it is interesting. Hawkins kicked one goal in five weeks. Who knows? Fremantle versus Sydney on the Friday night. And uh, this game was... Set against the very sad backdrop of Cam McCarthy's passing being made public news, like, I want to say the day of the game, forgive me the time zones. Obviously tragic stuff, horrible thing to happen, and, um, you know, I, I almost feel like it's bad taste to really critically analyse Fremantle too heavily in this game. It's very hard to quantify what impact that would have, particularly the timing of it. And, uh, you know, there was a number of players that were teammates of McCarthy in that game. So 
I'll stop short of really roasting Fremantle for what was a frustrating night on the field. They got undone by probably the best side in the competition right now. I mean, Sydney are the number one team from scores from turnover by some distance. That's, you know, one way they beat Fremantle in this game. And if that wasn't enough, they're also the number one team for scores from stoppage and scoring from the defensive half. So the statistical profile of Sydney um, is very, very ominous. Sydney's pressure was hard for Fremantle to cope with. Again, I mean, I think that's probably what we'd sort of expect anyway. And you look at certain stats, it was 51 to 46 inside 50 Sydney's way. Fremantle won the clearances by one despite losing the hitouts massively. Grundy had a big day out over Luke Jackson, 41 to 13. And yet Fremantle still did okay in this area and, you know, had like three less scoring shots, I want to say. Yeah, 22 scoring shots to 19. Big elephant in the room. They kicked four goals, 15 in this game. So again, hard one to analyze. The better team won. As we'd expect, I wouldn't read too much into the margin. Equally, we've got a couple of comments here. One, the history of Apple says RIP Cam McCarthy. And Zelmazam says it's hard to play footy when you lose a teammate. Yes, I can't imagine. Then we had a slight upset, I would say. Hawthorne getting the job done over St Kilda. I say slight upset in the sense that, you know, St Kilda really should have fancied themselves to win this game. That's what I would say. And, um, you know, it's not completely unpredictable because St Kilda have been, you know, in some lackluster form. I think in their last five games, they've only beaten North Melbourne. Comparatively, Hawthorne's won three of their last four now. Having just beaten the Western Bulldogs, you have to have given them a chance in this game. And I did consider tipping Hawthorne. I really did. But for me, I went with St Kilda for the James Sicily factor, obviously missing through that shoulder. But Hawthorne led all day. Um, you know, I think St Kilda really let themselves down with some ball use issues. And, you know, there's a number of comments that I might just skip straight to because there's quite a few. We've got a few on Hawthorne. We've got a few on St Kilda. So Leon Mead says, Hawthorne are going 17-6 and six and winning the grand final by 100 points. <laughs> Yeah, agreed, man. Uh, ben Schulz says, I think the Hawks could push towards the 8 and finish 12th to 9th on the ladder based on their recent performances. So on this, it's, it's hard. I, I don't know if I trust their consistency yet. Um, and I you know, I mean, Hawks fans can think that what they want, you know, perfectly reasonable to be optimistic about your team. And they are in some good form. But as an outsider looking at it, you know, I, I thought Hawthorne's best form last year was pretty damn good. Um, and yet they just couldn't find that consistency. And considering they are the second youngest team in the competition, I would still expect more inconsistency. So I, I would be surprised if they're up uh, between 12th and 9th, but I do now think they'll at least finish higher than West Coast. We've got a number of uh, St Kilda ones. Richo the Cat says, St Kilda have got to be the most overhyped, overrated, yet underperforming team in any sport. <laughs> they'll do this every year, get hyped up, win a few games, but also lose to the poor teams. I don't care if they have good youth. History shows with this team, they'll always prioritize that over the hill or mediocre players. They need to restart again, and it's just a continuous cycle. Naga says, St. Kilda officially cooked in season 2024. An AFL All-Star says, being at the game, St. Kilda are too slow with their starts and always have to catch up, and our ball movement is horrendous out of defense. So a bit to unpack there. First of all, I don't know if I would say St. Kilda were overhyped. Um, you know, I, I did put them highly. I rated them as as uh, fifth on the ladder that was my predicted ladder on the basis that you know with their youth in a pretty good age window where they could reasonably improve and the quality form we saw last year where they finished sixth on the ladder and finished the season poorly I thought it was a strong argument that they would improve there's absolutely no doubt they're underperforming I don't think I would go as far as to say they need to refresh and restart I think I do think maybe this current group of mature talent that they have, it does seem like a long shot that this team's going to click and win a flag in the next few years. But similar to the, what I said about the Western Bulldogs with that young budding group, I do think St Kilda have a good start on the next rebuild. So I wouldn't say they need to rebuild, but probably more of a list reset in a way. And trade and free agency makes that a little bit easier these days. As for their season being cooked, yes, yes. I think you compare it to preseason expectations. It's down the toilet. Essendon beating GW West was a fantastic result for the Bombers. And to quote Ken Collins, this was probably the result needed to really legitimize themselves. And now you look at their body of work. They've beaten a quality team in GW West. Yes, it was a marble. Nonetheless, it was still a very good win. They came from behind. They showed character. They got individuals playing well. They've been challenged at times this year, sometimes in games against good opponents, sometimes against not so good opponents like West Coast in Perth, and yet they've risen to the challenge most of the time. In fact, they've only lost two games this year to Sydney and Port Adelaide. So I do think this is one of the biggest statement wins of this round. Up there with Port Adelaide, that's probably the other one. But they won the inside 50s 57 to 40 in this game. Second week in a row, they've won the inside 50s heavily. 
Um, Kyle Langford is having a great season, reinvented himself as a forward in the last 18 months um, to great effect. Jake Stringer's, again, damaging as hell. We know about Nick Martin. You know, Zach Merritt, I don't think, was even outstanding in this game. I think Essendon's depth of contributors has definitely increased, and I'd imagine they're going to move up my power rankings this week. We've got a few comments. Morcus Morcus says, the Bombers are for real. So Carl says, also Carlos, says Essendon are the real deal. They might actually win a final this year. Ben Schull says, Essendon third place on the ladder is not just luck or random or temporary. They are actually the third best in the league, if not top five. I need to consider where I rank them in my um, rankings as to whether or not they're top three. I mean, if, if you look at power rankings as, as like the last five, I think there's only two undefeated teams, them and Collingwood, and they drew with each other. So on form, it's hard to argue against that. Time will tell with Essendon because I'm just a little bit concerned about the way they finish seasons. But there's no doubt that the quality that they're displaying now is the best it's been for a long time. I want to say like Joe Watson, 2012. I feel like they started 2012 like 8-0. and Like probably the best version of Essendon I I can remember since the Asada thing. Therefore, Brad Scott deserves a lot of credit for that. I think he's really good at extracting talent out of the lists that he's got. And from memory as well, I think Essendon have a fairly easy fortnight. I can't remember who they play. I think Richmond might be one of them. It might even be North Melbourne, the other one. Um, So a really good chance to almost put one hand on a final spot. And yeah, I think they could win a final this year for sure. Let's talk about Richmond versus the Western Bulldogs. This game was ugly. It was very one-sided. And the injury situation at Richmond is crippling at the moment. So on top of their pre-existing injuries, they lost Morris Rioli Jr. to a lower leg injury, Sam Banks to concussion, and Jack Graham did, I think, his third soft tissue injury this season. The Bulldogs absolutely cashed in. Norton, Darcy, and Harms kicked four goals each. The inside 50 count was 77 to 41. Stats-wise, I don't know how much there is to read into this game other than uh, the Bulldogs clearly have the forward line prowess and potency to put teams away when they're getting the ball inside 50. The Tigers brought in Bolter, Prestia, and Graham this week. Um, and, you know, it's just been replaced by more injuries. And I, I hate to say it, but this reminds me a little bit of West Coast. They're, they're trapped in a cycle now of having injuries early in the season. Injuries continued. They're forced to bring plays back before they're ready, perhaps. And therefore, they're not quite match fit and therefore are not playing to their usual standards. The results get worse. Ollie's on the ball says, Richmond need a fresh start and high draft picks with their injury list. CEO gone and Dusty maybe finishing. It's obviously they need to completely rebuild and their premiership era is over. AFL Snap says, Richmond are a lot worse than we thought. So as for them being worse than we thought, I, I, I do think this is largely injuries. Yes, they need a, re- a fresh start. Absolutely. I think that's um, well and truly telegraphed. And, you know, the, again, there's similarities to the West Coast story where they traded out a couple of drafts in a row. I think they're in a good position to, to load up with draft picks this year. We, their draft hand is really good. Maybe Liam Baker and Jack Graham find new homes this year. That's all going to replenish itself quite naturally. So I don't think they're in a bad spot from that perspective. But yeah, a rebuild is a foregone conclusion. Gold Coast took on North Melbourne and won by 68 points. This game probably, you know, was a little bit closer than the final score suggests. I think the Suns kicked seven goals in the last quarter. It felt like uh, North played a pretty high possession chip mark style. And, um, you know, I think that worked somewhat. Uh, but their ball use inside 50 really let them down. Again, not sure how much there is to read into this game. I mean, Flanders was outstanding. 29 disposals and 10 intercepts in his new backline role. Um, we saw LDU have 35 and a goal. It's probably statistically his best game for the year. Interestingly, though, Gold Coast are 5-0 and when playing in Darwin. And I do realize that that has probably shifted because they probably don't play big teams there. Therefore, easier fixture. But nonetheless, good record. And they're 5-4 and four at the moment this year. So just keeping in touch... Just keeping in touch with the finals calculations, even if I don't think they'll make it. Then we had a thriller for the ages between Collingwood and West Coast. Um, Collingwood winning this game by 66 points. Now, this was a game where I felt like Collingwood really flexed some muscle. Um, You know, I don't want it to sound like I'm just reframing an Eagles loss as though it wasn't that bad. But I must say, I was watching Collingwood and I was blown away by their intensity and pressure in this game. And, you know, I know they had lots of outs for this. A lot of those outs seem to be forward half players. Their midfield and backline is still very strong, and that is where they won this game. They were dominant. They were relentless with their pressure. Their leg speed, their ability to cut through West Coast on transition was outstanding. West Coast is not a very strong leg speed side, and that's where this game was won and lost, particularly 
from stoppages. The the injury stuff is getting you know a little bit more concerning. I think they had three injuries in this game. Jeremy Howe hurt his groin. Hopefully that is short term. Harvey Harrison also uh, did an ankle in this game, got subbed out, and then I think Bartel was the sub. I could be wrong, but I think Bartel was the sub, and he got a concussion as well. So a little bit of pressure on them as well. But one thing that did stand out to me in this game was their mature age recruits. Slocky Sullivan was once again good, but Joe Richards in particular um, was fantastic. He had 18 disposals, eight score involvements, six tackles, three goal assists, and one goal. And his pace and intensity and confidence, that was one thing as well. Like Even their, their lesser lights came to this game with confidence. They played well as a system. Colin Luda back. And the final game of the round, like I said, this might have been the best finish, in my opinion, even though we didn't get a winner. Um, momentum swinging between Adelaide and Brisbane ended in a draw. Um, the lead changed 13 times throughout this game. Halfway through the last quarter, I thought the Lions were onto a winner. I did tip them. I know they had injuries. I just thought we might see a gutsy Brisbane performance. That was just more gut feel than anything. Then the Crows kicked four in a row. Lions got one back. Archie kicked four goals. I thought Crouch uh, was quite important in the last quarter. It felt like Adelaide... Um, I don't know what the stats say, but the Adelaide were winning clearances, and Crouch was a big part of that, and his tackling was fantastic. He had 13 tackles. I think Dawson, again, big game player. You just know that someone like a Jordan Dawson is going to lift when his team needs him. And Darcy Fogarty kicked four goals as well. So we have one comment from this game. Marco one says, Adelaide will come back, make finals, and be a threat with the return of some key players. Now, I will say, this comment was actually made before the game, if I'm not mistaken. So this was not made with the benefit of knowing this result because I, I actually think this result is the worst possible result for both clubs. Maybe it's better than the loss. I guess you would say that. But these guys are now log jammed. They're like right near each other on the ladder. Three wins, five losses, and a draw now. Um, that is a not ideal result for two teams that really need to get on their bike in terms of making finals. Now, I don't think... If you ask me to bet on it right now, I'd probably have both of these sides missing. It's not to say that neither side can make progress this year. I mean, Adelaide, I just looked at their list, and there's a lot of players, like like decent players that are approaching that 50-game mark. So there's still development and growth to come from this group. If they fall short of finals but have a good back end of the year, that could set them up for next year. I still think there's a lot to play out this year. And Brisbane as well are exposing a young group of players they have coming up from below that haven't really seen too much daylight up to this point. You know, lots of NEFL and VFL action. But looking at the finals race, like it's, it's tight. There's a lot of half-decent teams that might have their measure considering they've dropped games they could have won early this year. We've got one final comment. It's more of a general comment on the round. Wade, member of the channel, uh, says that six of the top eight spots are now locked in. Sydney, Geelong, GWS, Melbourne, Carlton, and Collingwood will play finals. The only question marks in the current top eight, according to Wade, are Essendon and Port Adelaide. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I, I don't disagree on any of the teams you've locked in there. Essendon are looking increasingly locked, but again, and I know their fans are going to hate me saying this, of course, there's still the trust element with them, provided they can run out a whole season. But like I said, if they really do have Richmond and North over the next couple of weeks, if they bank two wins there, then you know they're in a great position to make it. I think they'll make it. I think Port Adelaide will make it. But then at the same time, I look at that and I think the top eight can't possibly be locked in yet. So we'll see what happens, but I, I don't you know, actively disagree. There you have it, guys. That is my take on round nine. Let me know in the comments what you thought. Um, you know, if you want to take part in this show ongoing, keep an eye out on the YouTube community tab. I do a post like every weekend, inviting you to make comments on the rounds. And, you know, as we get more comments, I'll have to be more selective with them. But for now, hope you enjoy the video. I appreciate you watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.